This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is The Verso Book of Feminism, Revolutionary Words from Four Millennia of Rebellion, edited by Jesse Kindig. Global in scope, The Verso Book of Feminism shows the breadth of feminist protest and of feminist thinking, moving through the female poets of China's Tang Dynasty to accounts of indigenous women in the Caribbean resisting Columbus's expedition, British suffragists militating for the vote, to the revolutionary petroles of the 1848 Paris Commune, the first century Trung sisters who fought for the independence of Nam Viet, to women in 1980s Botswana fighting for equal protection under the law, from the erotica of the 6th century and the 19th century to radical queer politics in the 20th and 21st. The Verso Book of Feminism is a weapon, a force, a lyrical cry, and an ongoing threat to misogyny everywhere. The Verso Book of Feminism, Revolutionary Words from Four Millennia of Rebellion, edited by Jesse Kindig, out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Fatima Bhutto is the author of a wonderful new novel called The Runaways, which is about post-colonial Pakistan and England and how three very different characters end up traveling to Iraq to join a jihad for a fantasized caliphate for reasons that have nothing at all to do with religious piety. Bhutto also writes about global pop culture and politics, and she has been a close observer of Pakistani politics her entire life. She is the granddaughter of Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who in 1977 was overthrown by the military dictator General Zia ul Haq, and then, in 1979, executed. Fatima Bhutto was born in Kabul, where her father, Mer Mortaza Bhutto, was leading an armed campaign against the dictatorship that had overthrown and murdered his father. Mayor Mortaza later returned to Pakistan to engage in civilian democratic politics. But there, he and six of his comrades were killed by Karachi police in 1996. Fatima holds her since-assassinated aunt, then-Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, responsible. This interview is about her novel, The Runaways, the first novel ever discussed on The Dig, as far as I recall. And we talk about the novel as a way to talk about the world and about Pakistan. Before we get started, if you like this podcast and you can afford to contribute and you like that we give away every episode for free, regardless of your ability to contribute please do make a monthly contribution now at patreon.com slash the dig. If you contribute at least 10 bucks a month, we will send you a left-wing book in the mail as a token of our gratitude. And also we are finally getting mugs and tote bags. And so you will be able to choose from those soon too. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. The link is in the show notes. And then... There's The Dig Book Club. Discuss the books discussed here on The Dig with fellow listeners and then discuss them with the book's authors on Zoom. Next up, Work Won't Love You Back. How Devotion to Our Jobs Keeps Us Exploited, Exhausted, and Alone by Sarah Jaffe. Visit thedigradio.com slash dig hyphen book hyphen club to join up. And that link is also in the show notes. Finally, finally, please do excuse any pronunciation errors. I think I did okay, but no doubt some things did not come out perfectly. Okay, here is Fatima Bhutto, the author of the novel The Runaways, and also New Kings of the Old World. Dispatches from Bollywood, Dizze, and K-pop. Fatima Bhutto, welcome to The Dig. 
Thank you for having me. You were born in 1982 in Kabul, where your father, Mayor Mortaza Bhutto, was in exile leading an armed organization fighting Pakistan's military dictator, General Zia ul Haq, who in 1977 had deposed and then, in 1979, executed your grandfather, Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Your father was later killed by police in Karachi. You held your aunt, the since-assassinated Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, responsible for the murder of your father. Your family remains one of two dominant political parties in Pakistan, and yet you are a novelist, an essayist, and an activist, and you say you won't get involved in party politics or run for office because of the impact that dynastic politics has had on Pakistan. What has that impact been, and how have you managed to carve out a different way of being a Bhutto in Pakistan and in the world? You know, at the time that that I spoke about Dynasty, it was 2007, 2008, and the country was under a dictatorship and the political chorus had started to sing the song that it that only certain things could remove this dictatorship and 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 so dynasty comes into the conversation really around that point which to me seemed very very dangerous i think also dangerous because pakistan didn't really have the democratic institutions and environment that would render dynasty less problematic, let's say. You know, if, if you're guaranteed to have elections every four years, five years, people vote according to whether they feel satisfied with their representative, then it ought not to matter um, if your representative comes from a family. What matters is the quality of their work, the quality of their service. But absent those structures, you enter a, a terrain where perhaps only certain members of certain families can enter the political field and have political voices. And and I found that dangerous. I think my reasons for not joining politics have changed. They they changed constantly. They changed from when I was a teenager to an adult, from when I was an adult, from one year to the next. I think that the impact of dynasty is a curious one. And and I, I, I don't think it... N- it need have been negative. It 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 could have been positive. It 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 could have been something other than perhaps what it is in Pakistan today, where you still have families as the loudest political voices. I wouldn't necessarily say that they have the best ideas. Sometimes they have interesting ideas. You want the the largest number of voices possible in any political sphere because ideas have to combat other ideas um, to survive to test themselves to be worthy. And I think dynasty can, especially in our environment in Pakistan, I think it can limit that. Is there a sense in which the tabloid-esque quality of these dynasties, whose dramas can play out in the public eye as parliamentary royal families of sorts, does that play into the sort of hyper, real, socially mediated spectacle that is the small p politics that dominates the world that you write about in your novel, The Runaways? Well, I would say something slightly different about it. I, I would say, at least in Pakistan's case, it's not necessarily tabloid-esque, but it's tragedy. It's tragedy that's watchable in the way people crane their necks at a, at a car crash or at an accident. They don't want to see something tragic or something bloody, but they do at the same time want to see something tragic and something bloody. And I think that's more the case in in Pakistan. But I also think we have such an unusual environment, which is that this is a country of tragedy. This is a country where tragedy affects everybody. It affects the powerful, the poor, the rich, the um, political, the anyone. And and so in that sense, it's it's something that we can that we see as a part of our everyday lives. Pakistan, to me, is a fascinating teacher because you have no separation from anything. You know, when I'm abroad and I'm traveling, I I always sort of marvel at the way in which you can just isolate yourself from tragedy or poverty or inequality or anything disturbing, really, because you can just move to better neighborhoods or put your children in better schools or 
live in certain parts of town and and for the most part be insulated. But you can't do that in in South Asia. You certainly can't do that in Pakistan because you have such a closeness to the world around you, to to its celebrations, to its mourning, to its grieving. You might live in the best part of town and go to the best schools and be a parliamentarian with all the privileges that power affords you. But you cannot distance yourself from fear, from from violence, from danger, from from everything, from from inequality. And I suppose that's the thing that always makes it into my writing, especially the the fiction. There's a wealthy family in your novel, The Ahmeds, and you write, quote, The Ahmeds, like many of their wealthy peers with flats in Kensington and Knightsbridge, who genuinely believed fashion shows were a way of resisting the Taliban, had very little to lament about Pakistan. It had been kind to them. Not since partition had they lifted a hand or shed a tear or sweated unseasonably for their country. I wanted to talk a little bit about the the ruling class in, in Pakistan. All ruling classes are bad, of course, but they're not entirely alike. Every ruling class, I think, is bad, perhaps, Hmm. in its own way. (laughs) You, 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 You write in your novel that it was a ruling elite born from a disaster capitalism, the disaster capitalism of partition, this kind of primitive accumulation camouflaged as national heroism. What are you getting at about a particular mindset and general way of being in the world of the Pakistani ruling class? Well... The Pakistani ruling class has has a tremendous amount to account for. Even if we look at at, at partition, and I and I say this obviously as someone who loves my country, but Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, never fought the British, so he never went to jail fighting the British Raj, and and he even mentions this in 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 his letters. I, I can't remember now. I, I, I know. People should look this up because I'm sure I'm making a mistake. But I think it was to, God, I can't remember if it was to Churchill or if it was to one of the viceroys. But there is a letter in which he says, you know, I'm, I've never even spent a day in a prison fighting the British. And he offers this as, I don't think flattery, I think he, as status, as he mentions it with some pride. And I think that's probably an incredibly telling detail, that the party that eventually made Pakistan and made Pakistan, as we've seen now, certainly for very, very good reason. You know, the feeling at the time was that Muslims would have been considered a second class citizenry in India, that they would ultimately be set upon and and attacked. Uh, That argument didn't really make sense to a lot of Pakistanis my age or my generation until, of course, Narendra Modi comes to power. And and now that, that prophecy looks absolutely correct when you see the way Muslims are currently treated by India's right wing government. So so even though the reasons were valid, that is a, a part of our, our beginning. And I think it carries on. A, a lot of people who came over were people who were landowners, who had large land holdings, who would not have to give it up at, at independence. And furthermore, developers, industrialists who are going to build fortunes uh, out of nothing, out of this empty country that now needed building. That said, Pakistan's ruling elite have managed to fortify themselves decade after decade behind higher and higher walls. And they've built a world in which they don't suffer um, the ruins of the country alongside the country. Of course, there'll be a point where they will. And I think that point is is pretty near, if not already there. Just to give you, for example, something like power. Pakistan has horrific um, en- energy crime, you know, power shortages. You have hours and hours and hours of no electricity. And what those who can afford it do is buy a generator. And that's what many of us do. And, and we have generators. And now it's hard to get fuel for those generators. You know, eventually... Eventually, everyone will be in darkness. But I think Pakistan's ruling class is venal because they've had plenty of opportunities to stand alongside those who are suffering in the country, and and they don't. And you see that really reflected in their politics, in their absence 
when it's required and their presence when you when you wish they weren't a part of the conversation. The, the current prime minister, Imran Khan, is an elite who denounces his fellow elites, which is, of course, familiar to us in the U.S. Khan has, he's condemned English-speaking elites as West toxified, connecting their decadence to their disconnection from ordinary Pakistanis, even though he has been supported by the very same sort of shadowy military forces that have forever shored up Pakistan's ruling class. Your novel paints a really devastating portrait of that ruling class. What explains Khan's anti-ruling class appeal, at least the appeal that he, he had during his rise? Well, it's... It's ridiculous, of course, because he is a party. He, he he always was a party that was supported by the elites when he joined politics in the early 90s. His was not a party of the poor, you know, it was a party of a lot of sort of technocrats and businessmen and English speaking people who normally in Pakistan there just isn't the space for in the political arena. They just don't have a constituency. And that was the beginnings of of Khan's political career. He does, of course, this thing that's in- increasingly popular all over the world, which is to to engage in this kind of double speak, um, where he rails against an, an elite. But his policies, as far as one can tell, um, his thinking, um, his general disdain for critics, his disdain for criticism, his disdain for the poor. Um, for the suffering, all that is is pretty elite. Imran Khan is someone whose political birth was ushered in by by the military, by by military dictators, by military generals. Um, you know, the PTI in its early days was I don't know I haven't read their latest manifesto, but in its early days they called for increases to the military budget. Um, and of course, now he says, just days ago, he said, oh, I'm the only p- politician in all of Pakistan that wasn't born in an army nursery. But that's just laughable. It's totally laughable. And, you know, this is what politicians do. And we see them manipulate the media, social media, manipulate our amnesia to get away with it. And so, of course, today, nothing means anything anymore. You can say one thing on Monday and another thing on Tuesday and attack everyone on Wednesday who remembered the thing on Monday. And and Khan does that, I think, as a matter of habit. He, his constituency as well is, um, it's, it's, it is interesting, it's an unusual constituency because a lot of it is a middle-class constituency. These are young Pakistanis, striving Pakistanis, you know, coming into the workforce. They're people who maybe didn't really find a space for themselves in politics because they didn't like the dynastic politics of the other parties, you know, they're not communists, so they're not going for these Mazdur Kisan um, parties that are about more left-wing policies, let's say, or left-wing um, ideas. And so Khan is the first kind of political movement that really sp- spoke to them, that, you know, had DJs at, at their political rallies, had chairs, so people didn't have to sit on the floor you know, held the rallies in places where the elite and even the middle class could go to because it was safe for them. You know, their cars wouldn't get stolen or they weren't afraid to go to those areas. So he he really begins his political career not as a man of the people, you know, of a man as a man of, of certain people. Continue, but he does this, he does obviously this strange thing, you know, which is that he he is a proponent of incredibly retrogressive you could even say right-wing or fundamentalist ideas. He allies with really rabid fundamentalist characters. You know, he praises them, he engages with them, he shares platforms with them. And yet at the same time is able to present himself as as a friend of the West when he wants. You know, he presents himself as a West-toxified person when he needs to and an anti-West person when he needs to. And, and he does this really... With a lot of ease, I think. Khan was viewed by many in the urban middle classes, as you just mentioned, as presenting this possibility of a break from Pakistani politics, dynastic stupor. But revealingly, before entering politics, he was a celebrity with whom I presume people felt a sort of parasocial relationship, which is what celebrities all about. A man who embodied the best of Pakistan through his mastery 
of cricket. And I was reading a, a 2012 profile written by Pankaj Mishra. He wrote of, quote, Khan's granitic handsomeness, which glamorized international cricket and sustained the British media's long fascination with his public and private lives. He ran on this anti-corruption ag- agenda, and the promise of it was assured by his own personal virtue. And an anthem of his party, the PTI, that Mishra cites reads, quote, a good heart and pure intentions will deliver justice, says Imran Khan. And I don't want to draw facile comparisons here, but obviously there's something very familiar about this whole celebrity filling a vacuum created by two major parties experiencing a legitimacy crisis. Do you think that there's a similarity there? And what does it reveal about the way celebrity functions in a moment where establishment politics has has lost credibility? Well, he's a he's an interesting person because, of course, he's a celebrity and an establishment <laughs> politician. So there's no denying that Imran Khan was a was a tremendous cricket player. You know, he brought Pakistan its cricket World Cup victory, its only World Cup victory so far, and a, a moment of great pride for the country. He also, after his his cricketing career ended, he, he put up a, a cancer hospital, uh, which offers cancer treatment at at low rates or free cost to those who need it. And again, is is something very worthy of 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 praise and 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 pride. But I I do think this idea, this this sense of Politics as being something that needs outsiders to come in and clean up is always a dangerous one, um, which is not to say that, you know, insiders do a great job. No, certainly not. But if you don't see politics as a, as a service, as being a servant of the people, then then I think you're going to have problems. And and this was clear with, with Khan very early on. He spoke constantly about corruption. By the way, he's reversed just about everything he ever said before he came into power. He spoke constantly about being against corruption, uh, uh, against the parties, these the two parties that dominate Pakistan's political sphere. And then, of course, the moment power was closed, who's in his cabinet? Everyone from those two parties who jumped ship and joined the new victor. It's something he's been criticized for a lot. And he always says in response, well, where am I supposed to get clean people from? You know, they don't fall from the sky. I have to work with who I've got. Well, who you've got are people with legacies of corruption that go back decades. I thought you were against that. You know, he he will say things like, Pakistan will never be a slave to the IMF. I would rather die than beg at the door of the IMF. And then what does he do? He takes out, you know, a suffocating loan from the IMF and says, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, it's the previous government's fault. I have to... I have to do with what I've been given. And so he's managed this really his entire career. He's managed he's managed to mean nothing that he says, really, unless unless he's talking about himself. And he sees himself, of course, as a paragon of all good things, of justice, of decency, of political uh, morality. But where is it in practice? It's it's. It's just absent. And unfortunately, people like me, and look, I'm I'm rare in that I never supported Imran Khan's politics. I never supported his political ideas. But even people like me who were not fans, um, even we're kind of shocked at, at some of the things that, that he does. Um, there's a case very recently of um, miners in Balochistan who, who died young men, poor men, and their families refuse to bury the, the dead. They re, you know, in Islam, you're required to bury your dead within 24 hours, 48 hours at the maximum. We bury, we bury quickly, though our grieving process is long. And um, the prime minister was nowhere to be seen. You know, he was meeting Turkish television producers. Uh, he was meeting YouTubers. You know, that's what a celebrity does, just to go back to your early question. But when the clamor became uncomfortable, he initially said, yes, I'll be flying to Balochistan to meet with the the 
victims' families, and then backtracked and said, I won't be blackmailed. What do you mean blackmailed? People have, people have died. You're, you're a representative of those people. So Imran Khan is one of those, you know, most people think they are let down by their leaders, but Imran Khan is a leader who feels constantly let down by his people. What about his late in life turn to Islamic piety, given his past as a, a jet set international playboy who was once married to one of the UK's top socialites? What made that transformation credible? Or is it actually something about those two things coexisting in one person that, that people found or find appealing? I think the man and the mythology are, are, are two different things. And I think probably both have served the sort of legend of, of, of Imran Khan. I, I think pious people are not put off by the fact that a lot of it looks hypocritical or unsubstantiated. Because in today's world, symbols matter, you know, performance is the only thing we have, I think. Performance is good enough. So I think the fact that he will say uh, uh, something religious, I think that the fact that he will say, look, Pakistan has to, uh, Pakistan has to produce its own culture because the culture of the West and the culture of Bollywood are immoral and they cause divorces. And, you know, I think that's sort of good enough for people. People like the sound of that. And it speaks to something, you know, that's not untrue. Okay, it's not untrue that... People are looking for wholesome content and people want their own stories to be watchable. I don't think they really will check too much if he means what he says. I, but but I, think it's, I think it matters that he says it with this sort of perfect English and, and the right accent and he's taken to straddle two worlds. I don't know. I find it, you know, I think of things like the, you know, the women's bill back in the day when when Iman was Iman Khan was in Parliament, General Musharraf brought in an, an amendment to Pakistan's Hudud laws, which are these really awful, awful laws brought in by General Zayal Haq, which essentially criminalize um, the victims of rape because what the Hudud ordinances say is that uh, adultery is a crime punishable by death and so is premarital premarital sex. So if, if you're a woman and you've been raped and you're married, you've just committed adultery. And if you're single, then, you know, you're still guilty. And of course, because of medical evidence, you can, you can check a woman, you can't check a man to see if he's a rapist. And so this amendment called the Women's Bill was brought into debate. And it, all it did was it changed or it amended one tiny portion of the law, which was that if According to the initial, the original law, if a woman wanted to prove rape, she had to bring in witnesses. Now, obviously, if they're Muslim men, you need less of them. If they're, if they're not men, then you need like double the amount or whatever, who were present at the exact moment of rape and watched all of it, but also happened to be really upright members of society. And so the amendment essentially said if a woman says she's been raped, she's been raped and she's allowed to file a, a police report without the witnesses. And Imran voted against that. So, you know, I think that's how he signals himself to be, I, I don't know, pious or politically, religiously leaning. But I, I, I really am at a loss at, at how to explain it with his views in general. Something that I've encountered preparing, researching for this interview is just this, and it's not unique to pa Pakistan, but it's a, it seems like a consistent theme, is this, this huge discrepancy between what politics is ostensibly about on the surface level and what's actually going on. And Tariq Ali wrote last year, quote, in response to accusations from the opposition that Khan was nothing more than a military stooge. One of his more flamboyant ministers, Faisal Vadwa, arrived at a TV debate carrying a large military boot. He placed it on the table and said to his counterparts in the PPP, the People's Party, and PMLN, the Muslim League, don't claim it's just us. You lick this boot too. And there's this way in which the, the military complicity and the corruption is just so out in the open. Your uncle, Asif Ali Zardari, Benazir Bhutto's widow, widower, is nicknamed Mr. 10% for his penchant to demand kickbacks. 
Maulana Fazlur Rahman, a right-wing Islamist leader whose support is in significant part due to his railing against U.S. imperialism, is known as Maulana Diesel, thanks to a diesel business he secured under one of your aunt's governments. When there's no real political differences in terms of the basic things that matter to people and civilian government's rule at the army's pleasure, what sort of, of social world and, and, and political mindset does that dissonance cultivate? Does it does it lead to a certain sort of nihilism as it has here in the U.S.? What it does is, and I think purposefully so, is that it destroys the political culture. What it says to people is, please don't get involved here. Please don't pay attention. This is either a joke in the case of Imran Khan's um, ministers and advisors and um, associates who just are, are caricatures, you know, who just say whatever they feel like saying. They get a slap on the wrist and, and they go quiet for five minutes and then they're back talking really just rubbish all over again. Or it's venality in the case of Zardari, who, as you said, was my aunt's husband and in her first term was known as Mr. 10% and by her second was Mr. 110%. <laughs> you, you know, and, and who is who is such a, an unapologetically venal person that it's frightening, that it's, that it's depressing to imagine that you might you might dirty yourself with with what is called politics in Pakistan. I think it's done it's done so on, on purpose. At the end of the day, it's Nawaz Sharif, Zardari, Imran Khan, you know, and Imran Khan, let's say he's interchangeable because tomorrow when there's not Imran Khan, there'll be someone else. You know, the army and some sort of Molana who has uh, made himself politically useful at, at the right moment. And it will just be these five people, always. It's been these five people for the last 25 years, 30 years in Pakistan. I don't think it's because we don't have any other options. I think it's it's done by design. These are all people who will do what is required of them by the establishment. They are not going to uh, go off course, as it were. There are people who will do what they're told. They might act up every now and again, and that's why you have to replace one with the other. And um, and that's it. And they won't tip over the apple cart. You know, business will run as, as usual. And everyone who is making money will make money, and the country will suffer. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not a supporter of Imran Khan's, but, but, but many young Pakistanis were. And when you ask them, listen, why are you supporting this person? Because... Here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem. They would answer you by saying, listen, he's something new. And listen, give him a chance. Again, you're familiar with this in America. You know, give him a chance. You never know. He might prove you wrong. And you know what? <laughs> Those kind of people never <laughs> prove you wrong because they're kind of out of central casting. And, and I think one of the damages of Imran Khan is not only that he has played a part in damaging this political culture, he's exacerbated the damage because his supporters, like Trump's supporters, like Modi's supporters, like Bolsonaro's supporters, are internet warriors. And so if you say anything about Imran Khan, as I'm doing now, you will be met with a deluge of hate mail, death threats, threats of violence to you. You will be attacked, 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 attacked constantly until you just say, OK, it's not worth talking about this person. And you go quiet. That's how his supporters deal with criticism. That's how he deals with criticism. He just shuts it down. You know, the Internet is a much more restricted place under Imran Khan than it was before him. Not to say that it was you know, massively free before him, but... But it's closing down, closing down, closing down. And he's certainly a part of a very vicious internet culture that makes sure that there is no disagreement politically. Of course, it's designed because what do you do with a population uh, that wants to be involved in politics? You can only keep them out with technical means for so long. At some point, I think you just, you make them see it as not worth it. What happens if disillusionment with Khan sets in, given that he promised a break 
with the status quo that so many people believed in. Currently, the the Pakistan Democratic Movement is leading a large-scale anti-Khan and anti-military protest campaign. But the movement is led by Maulana Diesel and is supported by the People's Party and the Muslim League. Is this just going to be one more push to replace one ruling elite faction with another? It's that revolving door of those five people. You can set your clock to Pakistani (laughs) political shenanigans. Anyone who wins an election, two years into their rule, there will be a coalition of their opponents working with some kind of support uh, to unseat them. You know, Khan did that to to Nawaz Sharif. Why would he be surprised that it's happening to him? You know, it's it's remarkably unimaginative at this stage because it's the same tactic recycled every every two years. I think, you know, I, I personally think that it's a huge disservice he's done to young people because even if for the wrong reasons they placed some hope in him, he, he lets them down in the same way everyone else has let generations of young Pakistanis down by not allowing them actually at the end uh, any voice, by not actually changing anything, by not, by not guaranteeing just the bare minimums to Pakistani society, whether that's education or health care or anything. Um, what will happen to him? I, you know, I don't know what will happen to him. He'll keep going. His career will keep going. His, you know, his sort of political associates may drift back to their older parties. They may stay with him. Who knows? But it's it's hard to overstate what rot there is at this point in time. Pakistan's economic situation is just outrageous. The the government heavily indebted to the IMF and other creditors, spending huge sums on the military through a secret budget, a military that also controls vast vast swaths of the economy. Much of the rural parts of Pakistan are a semi-feudal order where people scrape out incredibly meager existences as sharecroppers on land held by an extremely small number of landlords. And meanwhile, the, the untenability of rural life has pushed huge numbers of people into the cities where they live on the margins and then can only hope to access basic services that should just be provided by the government like sanitation and electricity through the corrupt party system and their affiliated organized crime groups. How has this elite managed to maintain such a brutal system in place? Because l- learning about the, the rural order in Pakistan blew, blew my mind. I was not aware of how it's not just unjust, it's incredibly backwards. Force. Uh, that's how it's, it stays in place. It's force, whether you're talking about uh, the, the landowners. I, know, I mean, of course, my family come from landowning stock. We, we, we are part of it. My grandfather's government was the last in, in Pakistan's history to put forward any land reforms. Of course, uh, more reforms were needed than, than the ones he put in in the 70s, but, but they're really the only ones that, that have ever happened. Um, but whether you're talking about the landowning elite or you're talking about the industrial elite or you're talking about the the establishment, the military elite, force. That's how they've managed to 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 control the country. Anyone who disagrees with the status quo is killed. They just remove you. They don't allow you to live long enough to cause real damage. They don't allow you to live long enough to to come to power and start moving things around. They just dis- dispose of you long before that. And you know you, you're talking about shock. You know, you you travel anywhere in the world, uh, and I really do believe this to be true, but there isn't poverty like South Asian poverty. And and I mean India here too. I mean Bangladesh here too. You know, you, you don't find nuclear armed nations where mothers are barefoot on the streets, where there are no gutters, where there's not even the the, the most basic of sanitation available to people. You just, you don't see that in any part of the world. I've never seen it when I've traveled, and I've traveled fairly widely. I've only seen that achingly desperate poverty in South Asia. It's not just lack of health care. It's not just lack of education. It's not just unfair, raging inequality, um, whether in agricultural or industrial 
environments, you also have a climate emergency in Pakistan. You know, Pakistan is, uh, I think it's the fifth most climate vulnerable country in the world. You know, we have something like 30 million climate migrants in our country alone. I mean, people who have lost their land, their home, their ability to work, to, to eke out a living due to climate change. I mean, that's not even a part of the discussion. We're not even beginning uh, that conversation in Pakistan. Imran Khan, to his credit, because one must give it where it's due, you know, talks a lot about tree planting. And and that's important. That's very important. And, and I think he has mentioned um, Pakistan's desperate climate situation uh, at home and abroad. But, but what are the steps being taken um, to address this? Nothing really that, that we can point to with any satisfaction. And, and this is what I, what I meant when I when earlier in our conversation, I said it's, it's untenable and it, it's always been untenable. But, but today's Pakistan makes that evident in a way, at least in my lifetime, I just haven't seen it before. The, the precariousness of life, um, that, that, that impacts everybody. It's not going to respect status or family background or any of that. It, it will consume everything unless it's addressed. Pakistani politics are often expressed through linguistic, ethnic, religious, and, and geographic divides. The People's Party leads in Sindh province. The Muslim League leads in Punjab. The People's Party has a historic conflict with, with the MQM in, in Karachi, which represents Mohajir refugees from India and their descendants. Religious reactionaries mass murder religious minorities and hold huge rallies demonizing religious minorities. Khan's PTI has historically led among the Pashtun minority in regions where the army continues to wage a totally brutal war. How is it that the political system has made these sorts of differences so much more dangerously salient than, say, poverty or climate change? Well, it's a a battle for resources and uh, power is centralized in in the Punjab, in Pakistan. It's the power center of the country. And so whether we're talking about water or energy or access to um, funds, it's it's just this never ending grab for for resources. It's telling, obviously, that aside from the Punjab, every other province has spoken at some point or the other, or threatened. You know, political um, forces in all of these places have threatened attacks against the center, have threatened uh, secession, and and that's that's resources, that's uh, provincial autonomy, and. It's, uh, you know, I think it's harder to, to discuss those things when you, when you have the political forces we do, um, being so transparent in, in Pakistan and, and the corruption being as, as transparent as it is. You know, Sindh can talk about water and yes, it's, it's true. We have a water problem, but we also have a corruption problem. And the people who are trying to have the provincial argument are the people who've stolen everything from sin. So where does that leave you? You end up being uh, tied in, in knots. But Pakistan is a, is a strange place, Dan, because it's, it's a country that was formed on the basis of religious refuge. But Pakistanis are very provincially loyal, in a way that perhaps we will see more now with India as India's politics uh, combust. But, you know, Pakistanis will automatically note uh, when they meet another Pakistani where they're from, you know, you know, from the name, usually, uh, last names, where someone is from. You know, if you're a Baloch, you have certain feelings about the state. Uh, If you're Sindhi, you have other feelings about... Punjab, if you're Pashtun, you have other feelings. And and there is a strong identification with one's provincial background rather than a national one. But on the other hand, I, I don't really see anything wrong with our mega, uh, like hyper suspicion um, of nationalism. I think it's in some, in some respects, it means that you have a population of people 
And Pakistan really is extraordinary in this way, who are profoundly political beings. It's in everything. It's in uh, not just the language or your ethnic identity, but you're forced to be political animals because it, it means politics determines whether you have health care or not, it, it, whether you have school or not. It depends whether you have freedom of movement or not. So you have these people who are restricted and stymied in all the ways that they are, but who are unafraid and who refuse to cease and desist and, and keep poking at the, at the political center, even when it shuts them out or shuts their voices out. In terms of the, the power of, of regionalism in, in Pakistan, and you mentioned that every basically every province that's not the Punjab has had some sort of secessionist movement or politics in the past. And it's worth noting that East Pakistan did secede and after surviving a, a brutal war became Bangladesh. Absolutely. You know, 1971 was 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 the first break in that in that idea that Pakistanis were all together because they were Muslims. You know, being Muslim was not enough to keep Pakistan together. You know, policies towards what was then East Pakistan uh, from the very beginning put them at a disadvantage. Uh, you know, from whether we're talking about language laws or uh, political representation or representation in the army, you know, forget about the fact that you have a thousand kilometers of, at that time, hostile Indian land in between you. You know, but it's a mistake that I don't think has ever been learned from. It's it's a history that's never been learned from in Pakistan. And it's not something that's spoken about very much in depth. Um, it's not very much remembered. And it's not remembered because the same thread is there in other provinces. And, you know, this is the curse of being young countries, is that you don't really have any excuse to forget your history. I mean, not just because there are generations who lived it, but it's so recent that the blood's not even dry. Such a young country and so many people who are today Pakistanis either migrated from what is now India or migrated from rural Pakistan to its cities in your home city of Karachi on the southern end of Sindh province on the Arabian Sea is today a city of 18 or I've read 20 million. But in 1947, its population was fewer than 500,000 and it was mainly Hindu. Does the newness of Pakistan with, with the new people stitched together from the dislocations of partition and so many other dislocations, does it create this void that leads to this fight over what Pakistan is and what it means to be Pakistani, part of this search for, for meaning and identity in both Pakistan and, as your novel addresses, in the post-colonial metropole in, London, in, in England as well? Um, I, I think so, yes. And I think it's important for us to constantly fight over what it means to be Pakistani, because this is an idea worth fighting over. It's an idea worth fighting. I mean, oh, I don't mean fighting, obviously, with guns and, and uh, violence, but I mean, debating and questioning. Yeah, and, and much, much too much of that. But, but, but these are ideas that have to be fought in conversation, that have to be fought in debate, that have to be challenged, that have to be tested so that they thrive so that they are strong enough um, to include everybody. You know, who? what does it mean to be Pakistani? It's something we are still trying to define, I think. And we must keep trying to define it until it encompasses everything. You know, you mentioned the beginnings of Karachi. It was not just um, a Hindu city, a, a Muslim city. It was also a Parsi city. It is still today a Parsi city. It's a, a Sikh city. It's a city that had a Jewish population. It's a Christian city. Karachi, because it's a port city, is a city that traditionally has always welcomed newcomers. So it's the most ethnically mixed city in all of Pakistan. Uh, there are Pashtuns, there are Afghans, there are Punjabis, there are Sindhis, there are Muhajirs. It's a city that, you know, at the time of the Raj, it was the closest point to England. So news that was being sent from England to the British Raj landed in Karachi first. So it's a it's a hungry city. It's it's a city that is not a I always say it's not a beautiful city. You've not been, have you? No. Oh, well, it's it's not a it's not a beautiful city, but it's a it's a fascinating place. 
it's not beautiful because it's it's a city of combat and people have fought those turf wars all over the city. Uh, whoever wins has built over the ruins of, of the other. You know, we have this uh, marketplace called Empress Market and everything is being bought by developers. And this was something that I, it was important for me to put in the runaways. Um, you know, everything is being bought by these filthy, corrupt developers, you know, who buy national heritage and then pull it down so they can build it up to look like the shopping mall they're putting up next door. And we've got this marketplace called Empress Market, which was named for Empress Victoria. And at the time of United India's first rebellion against its occupiers, you know, the 1857 War of Independence, what we call the War of Independence, and the British called the mutiny. Officers who rose up against the Raj in the city of Karachi were shot out of the mouths of cannon in Empress Market. And there's not one plaque anywhere in this market that says so. There's not one plaque that says on this spot, Pakistanis, you know, Indians, whatever you want to call them, died for our freedom. Nothing. It's, it's, it's a city of buried secrets and, you know, buried history everywhere, every corner of it. And so what does it mean to be Pakistanis? You know, that's part of what it means. It's when Zia ul Haq was in power, when he was at that time, of course, a CIA-backed dictator, receiving arms and money to the tune of billions from Ronald Reagan's White House. To support the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan. Exactly, to support the anti-Soviet jihad, your friends who became the Taliban. When Zia al-Haq was in power, he started to change Pakistan's laws and he put in those hudud laws. You know, he put in the the strictest iteration of the blasphemy laws that that makes the news today. And he put in these laws that said just horrific things like the fact that he wanted it to be, he wanted theft to be punishable by amputation, by cutting off the hands of the thief. But he wanted to make Pakistan Saudi Arabia and, and he couldn't because not one person in all of Pakistan could be found to carry out an amputation. And when the state couldn't get you know, military people or executioners to to carry out amputations, they went to butchers and asked butchers to carry out amputations. And even the butchers refused. So that's what it means to be Pakistani. But I think, you know, the age of the internet has confused us all. And so we think it means to be modern, whatever modern means. You know, we think it means to be international. We think it means to be accepted by the outside world. But I, I don't really think that makes up much of it. There's so much else. You've written about the huge popularity of Turkish TV dramas in Pakistan, in particular Ertugrul. And it's a series about, a dramatic series, if I understand correctly, about the people who went on to found the Ottoman Empire. Not about the Ottoman Empire, but right before its founding. Is that right? Uh, it's about the father of the founder of the Ottoman Empire, yeah. And and you suggest, I think, that this echoes, this, this, this shows popularity in Pakistan, that this echoes 1919 to 1922 when Indian Muslims organized something called the Caliphate movement in support of the Ottoman Empire that was falling apart at the time. What sort of parallel do you, do you see there between Indian Muslims' hope to find belonging in the Ottoman Caliphate a century ago and whatever Pakistani viewers are seeking today from Ertugrul? Hmm. Well, the, the, the caliphate, you know, uh, falling was a tremendous blow to Muslim people who, you know, it, of, you, we always hear the Ottomans described as the, was it the sick man of Europe. But of course, that's not how it looked from where we were standing. You know, the Ottomans were um, a vast empire. They were an empire that absorbed so many cultures that was ruled by, by Muslim men who were seen to be just and wise and 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 visionaries of the of their time Pakistan and Turkey aside I mean Pakistan and Turkey have a really long standing affection for each other it's a really curious phenomenon that I don't particularly understand even having written a book about it but the ottoman some the ottoman empire meant something to muslims it it was power it was a noble power a dignified power that muslims i 
identified with, at least I'm talking about Pakistanis, I'm not obviously talking about Syrians or Lebanese who were under the yoke of the Ottomans and hated them. But there was a kind of romantic quality, I think, that that Pakistanis and Indian Muslims at that time felt, um, even sending you know money and raising the, the banner cry under the Khilafat movement. It means pretty much the same thing today, I think. When the, when the world sees you as essentially 19 hijackers, you know, when the world has reduced you to bloodthirsty, bearded barbarians, th- this is not just, po- you know, politically consequential in terms of the wars of occupation, the drone strikes, the politics, but it's psychologically, it's, it's psychologically damaging. Anytime a Muslim sees themselves depicted on screen, they're blowing something up or shooting a Kalashnikov. And it's really been, I mean, forget, you know, since George Bush, it's been there since Rambo, it's been there since, um, since the fall of the Soviet empire, which is when America and the West needed new enemies and, and they chose <laughs> us. What the Turks have managed to do really subtly and really with great sophistication is to recast the image of the modern Muslim. And they do that through dramas set in Istanbul today. And they also do that through dramas set in 1217 or whatever it was. And what they do is they show Muslim men who are not subjugated. They are Muslim men who are leaders. They are kings. They are honorable. Even if they are ordinary men, they are ordinary men fighting great powers, but fighting great powers for truth, for justice. You know, the the heroes of Turkish television are not uh, hedge fund owners, you know, that, which is interestingly what Bollywood heroes are, you know, they're Wall Street bankers. But the heroes of Turkish Dizzy are, are good men. They might be small men, but they are good men. And you know, they've just taken Pakistan by storm. I mean, they've taken lots of countries from South America to Eastern Europe by storm, but are going to get so much hate mail. (laughs) But to go back to even the the country's prime minister, you know, is a huge fan. You know, Imran Khan has stymied Pakistani films from coming out, but you can't stop him talking about Turkish television. You know, know, whether it's the UN or a political gathering of his supporters. He's always talking about Ertegrul in these shows. And I I think for that reason. How does this Turkish model for the modern Muslim and its appeal, huge appeal in Pakistan, fit into this contest for influence in Pakistan between Saudi Arabia and Turkey? And and what are the stakes of that of that contest? Yeah, they're massive. I mean, it's, you know, in in the proxy wars that Saudi Arabia is, is fighting all over the world, it's, uh, we don't often think of culture as, as an accompaniment, but, but of course it, it is. You know, you'll remember that after Jamal Khashoggi was dismembered uh, at the Saudi embassy in Istanbul, I think the first visit that, the first state visit that he made, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, was to Pakistan, and he was welcomed with like an almost absurd amount of pomp. So, you know, Imran Khan picked him up from the airport, drove him himself, you know, they sat in a horse-drawn carriage, sort of like, um, you know, like a, like, a, like a period drama, you know. <laughs> I, I haven't seen a horse-drawn carriage in Pakistan in a really long time. But, you know, it was one of those really ornate ones. And, you know, they even, they even blocked the internet they even made sure that not like Twitter, I don't know what they did to Twitter, but they did something to ensure that negative comments, tweets or whatever about MBS, um, that they wouldn't show up. People lost access to their accounts for the sort of 38 hours he was there or whatever. Um, Pakistan, of course, uh, has uh, lo- had taken loans from Saudi Arabia. But a loan from Saudi Arabia is like a loaded gun to the head. You know, the moment you don't do what they want you to do, they demand their money back, which, of course, they they did. Turkey offers Pakistan a a third way. Iran is, you know, Pakistan is not going to join the Iranian ambit just yet because of sectarian feeling in Pakistan. Um, There there are issues about that. Yeah, currently there's huge 
violent campaigns against against Shia in Pakistan. Yes, and Pakistan is a Sunni country. It's got a large Shia population, but that Shia population is persecuted really with a lot of impunity. And it's you know for many years, again when I when I'm outside Pakistan or. Um, people will say, oh, you know, is it dangerous to be a Hindu in Pakistan? It is much more dangerous to be a Shia in Pakistan today. So there are sectarian issues. Of course, there are other issues, you know, gas pipelines and all these other things that that would benefit Iran and, and, and Pakistan. You have historic ties, you have linguistic ties. You have culturally a lot more in common with Iran, obviously, than, than you do with Saudi Arabia. But Turkey offers Pakistan a kind of third way. Erdogan's Muslim Brotherhood politics are much closer to Imran Khan's to begin with. And I think Turkey is an incredibly sophisticated operator. So they know very well what they're doing and, and how they are casting themselves as as leaders of the future. I think they are banking on a lot of geopolitical changes. I don't think they're wrong. I think they're quite right to think that, you know, Europe is... In trouble, Europe has fragmentation. You know, the West is, well, it's in decline. You know, whether that decline is imminent, no, I don't think so. But but it is. You have a trade war with China. Uh, you've got Indian hostilities with China. And I think Turkey imagines um, a role for itself in the future. And they're taking bets on that role. I think Pakistan is correct to to bet on them too, actually. And I think it would be beneficial for Pakistan as much as for Turkey. But I can't guess whether that's what the Pakistani government is thinking. Maybe they just like TV shows. <laughs> like the rest of us. <laughs> like, like the rest of us, exactly. This is Sarah Jaffe, and you are listening to The Dig with Daniel Denver, my favorite podcast for thoughtful discussions on the U.S. left and beyond. And you can support it on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Haymarket Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is... Black Lives Matter at School, an uprising for educational justice by Jesse Hagopian and Denisha Jones. Black Lives Matter at School succinctly generalizes lessons from successful challenges to institutional racism that have been won through the Black Lives Matter at School movement. This book will inspire many more educators and activists to join the Black Lives Matter at School movement at a moment when this anti-racist work in our schools could not be more urgent and critical to education justice. As Ibram X. Kendi says of the book, The educators, students, and community activists whose stories are documented here are fighting for a transformative vision of what public schools can be and the grassroots efforts we will need to get there. Black Lives Matter at School is an essential resource for all those seeking to build an anti-racist school system. Black Lives Matter at School, an uprising for educational justice by Jesse Hagopian and Denisha Jones. Out now from Haymarket Books. This question of national identity you make very clear in your novel is reflected like like everything else is in the class divide. The elites in your novel certainly still look to the West. The father of one of your protagonists is this wealthy, anglicized elite who makes regular visits to London. And there's this remarkable passage about how he really wants his drivers in London to be white, to be European men rather than second-generation Desi Muslims, Muslims who might, say, chide him for his lack of piety, people who he deems to be BBCD, or British-born confused Desis. What does a Pakistani elite find to be so confused, or perhaps really more so uncanny, about a working-class Desi immigrant in London? And what is it that a Pakistani elite wants to experience? on their trips to London, the old metropole of the empire that bestowed upon them (laughs) their post-colonial power. Yes. Well, the main thing there is um, when a Pakistani old elite 
goes and encounters a working class they see somewhere else, like in England or America, the first thing he loses is his power. Because that elite has no power in that world. He has no power in London. He's nobody in London. He's a foreigner in London, whereas the BBCD or the ABCD, for American, born and confused, um, <laughs> is a native, is a citizen, holds a, a much valued and much desired passport and all the freedom that that brings him. He doesn't know who the elite's father is and what neighborhood he lives in. He couldn't care uh, at all. So immediately his power is is swept away from underneath him. And they're equals for all intents and purposes. Maybe not even equals because the Pakistani elite, well, listen, if he's a really good elite, he has more than a Pakistani passport. But let's, for the sake of argument, assume that he doesn't have anything more than a Pakistani passport. Then he even has less power than the working class immigrant who he looks down on. So that that's, that's the first thing. I think it depends. Depends if we're talking generationally. So in The Runaways, Monty's father is the one who doesn't like the Uber drivers because they're always going to lecture him on whether he's fasting. But Monty, his son, who's, you know, in his late teens, 18, 19, Monty doesn't think of that at all. You know, Monty doesn't have the same view of power as his, as his father does. I don't think the younger generation does because the younger generation's power... Um, is the same power that the working class kid in Portsmouth has, which is the power of communication, of the internet, of celebrity, um, even if it is the celebrity of, you know, influence on Instagram or TikTok. So they're, they're working on more equal footings. You know, they, they live in this world of likes and virality and notoriety. And, and so I think there's less that's, that separates them. There's less of a one-upmanship, or at least a millennial's one-upmanship is can be fought <laughs> daily, several times a day. You've got plenty of opportunities for your post to get more hits than the other guy's post. Yeah, they're a world apart from the old elite. You know, I, I remember when the Queen came to, Queen Elizabeth came to Pakistan. But from what I remember, she came on an anniversary of, like partition and independence, which to me seems in horrifically bad taste. Like, why would you come back on the anniversary of when you were thrown out? But but in any case, um, she made a trip to India and Pakistan. I think it was 1997, which would make it an anniversary. And when she came to Pakistan, the, the speaker of the assembly, of the Sindh assembly, welcomed her by saying, we remain your humble servants. <laughs> that tells you, I think, everything you want to know about the old elites. And there was also, I believe I read somewhere, a moment of silence in the Sindh assembly after the death of, was it Michael, <laughs> Michael Jackson? Jackson? Yes, yes. There was a moment of silence um, <laughs> uh, in the up. Sindh assembly. <laughs> you know, every every couple of years, there's a story that says like rats and fests in the parliament, and, like everyone gets a huge laugh out of it because... You know, rats are far more honorable creatures um, <laughs> than the people who occupy the Sin Parliament. But but yeah, they've got nothing else to do. You know, in the Sin Parliament, in the Pakistani Parliament, they are really big fans of doing these tokenistic kind of things. Like, you know, they pass a resolution against sexual discrimination. Like, oh, how wonderful! Why don't you make it safe for women to walk on the streets first? You know, before you're worried about passing these things that are going to get you praise in Western newspapers that don't actually care what you're doing in your country to begin with. You know, it's just what it looks like. And for some reason, they thought it would be good to have a moment of silence for Michael Jackson. You were discussing how young elites have a different conception of power and status than their elders. And the characters in, in your novel are looking to be seen and recognized on social media, but also to really escape and even obliterate themselves, something they're constantly refreshing their Twitter feed to encounter waiting for likes that often never come. And you have Islamic state fighters remaining social media obsessed while deployed in the desert, unable to relate to themselves and to the world, even while at war, save for through this these curated social media personas. What you have one protagonist who's taking selfies with his Kalishnikov in the place of, you know, a pet or a girlfriend. 
But sometimes what your novel makes clear is what someone is looking for is far more basic, but somehow more elusive, like coming to terms with the fact that they're gay. And your novel portrays Islamic conservatism as and jihad as speaking to to a void. What is this this void? Is it is it created by social media or is social media filling a void created by the post-colonial neoliberal world? And and what does it mean when this symbolic power that the younger generation respects when it proves to be so empty and unfulfilling? The void is is the self. I mean, all all suffering begins and ends with the with the self, with the idea of significance, the idea of having to attain significance, hold on to it, maintain it, prove it, perform it, I think. And the culture we live in today, which is a culture of excessive wealth of individual over everything, it can only it can only veer in the direction of suffering. It can only veer in the direction of uh, constant pain. I think that the the fighters that we that we saw in the last iteration of um, those fundamentalists um, that called themselves IS uh, understood this. They understood this this longing to be somebody. This this terror at 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 the idea that the self might be nothing, you know, that that it might be meaningless. And they also understood the sort of Western capitalistic neo-imperial tools to distract you from that terror. You know, the drone footage, the rousing soundtracks, the cinema-like um, shooting of whatever, you know, scenery, beheadings, what, whatever you want. And so they used this incredibly Western technology and all these symbols of modernity in order to offer some some ease or some 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 forgetting of that of that terror of nothingness of of the self being meaningless um and they did so with with great effect you know they're not the first people to do that you know it's the same thing that the army tells you in america when they say you know join the army be somebody if that's what the slogan is it's the same thing that everyone tells us all the time. Drink this drink. You'll be someone. Use this deodorant. It'll make you seen. It'll make people know you're someone. It's just the same argument that everyone is using. And I don't know if it's because of the internet, but, but we just see it all day long, you know, from everywhere, from every quarter. No one is safe from this empty message being pumped into our bloodstreams. So I don't know if that answers the question, your very eloquent question, but but I think that's it really. Yeah. Yeah. So many of your characters are looking to find themselves by escaping themselves through social media, but wherever they go, there there they are. Yeah, of course, because that's the that's the genius of social media, isn't it? It's it it promises you a platform, but you have to constantly be screaming on that platform. Um, it tells you, in order for people to hear you, oh, but there's uh, 8 million other people screaming about the exact same thing you're screaming about. You'll have to scream better, scream louder, scream faster. You know, the other scream got noticed before your scream. And so all we do is just spend our time uh, screaming really into nothing. I mean, I, I say this of myself too. I'm not, you know, I'm a child of the internet as much as anyone else. And it's 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 empty calories. You know, what do we get out of it? There's no sustenance from it, really. Yeah, and no, I'm also guilty. And there's a certain feeling one has after engaging too deeply in, and in particular engaging in certain types of ways with social media that just leave me feeling like garbage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. A lot of it. I mean, it happens every now and then that I like see an article and it's even rarer. I will read that article instead of just the headline and I'll walk away saying, oh, I just I didn't know that. But most of the time, it's just like you said, it's just garbage. And and you feel you feel like what you consume, I guess. Your novel emphasizes that people's turn to the Islamic state literally has very little to do with Islam as a religion. And while it is for some a, a revolt against the West, 
of sorts. For your characters, it seems much more so a revolt against their parents and maybe even more so again against themselves. What do people miss when they take IS's rationale as the actual reason, stated rationale as the actual reason people joined IS? Mm -hmm. They miss everything. I'm so glad you asked that. They actually miss everything because you can't solve a problem if you don't understand it. If you... If you have a broken limb, you can't heal it unless you know which bone is broken. And and actually, uh, it's a great sleight of hand on IS's part, you know. Yeah, I, I, IS says this is about Islam, and the US says, because oh yeah, it allows it's, them... it's about Islam. <laughs> yeah, it's but it's a it's a phenomenal ruse because it's not about Islam. It's about loneliness. It's about anger. It's about humiliation. It's about freedom. It's about power. It's about masculinity. And if you're only chasing Islam, you're going to miss all those other things. And there are many more angry, lonely, humiliated people than there are Muslims, you know, according to IS's definition. And, you know, just on a very basic level, we know because IS, you know, they like all uh, power structures love record keeping. They loved record keeping. And so, um, they were constantly keeping records and data on the people joining them. Like they would give them these kind of little, not quizzes, but they'd give them, you know, these little sheets to figure out what's their understanding of Islam when they would arrive, when the recruits would arrive. And by their own record keeping, they found that like the majority of people were, had a below average understanding of religion. They de- had no clue what, what it was that they were supposedly uh, the warriors of. You know, you have the case of those two young boys who were um, English boys. They were Britons and um, they were caught at some point. Um, and one of them had a copy of Islam for Dummies on him. <laughs> you know, it's, that's a real story. And, and you know, you, you, can't, you can't make it up. It's true. And, and, and I think, you know, governments, know, they know this. You know, but it's great television, isn't it? And it's great for the media. And it's just, it feeds the narrative to have all these stories about Muslims being backwards and being depraved, uncivilized people. You know, you don't want to really think too far into this thing that you're making up because it'll unravel. And there's there's actually, you know, I always mention this one story of this young woman uh, who I think is from Alabama called Huda Muthana. And I forget what her what her family's background was, but but they were very strict Muslims, her parents. And, you know, she was born in in America. She was raised in America. She went to an American public school. Her friends are American. And all she wanted to do was to just be a normal American girl. And her, her parents wouldn't let her, you know, they wouldn't let her go to sleepovers. They wouldn't let her go to football practice. They wouldn't let her. And she says, I think it's a CBS interview that she says this in. She says, you know, I ran away to be free. I ran away to join IS to be free. And and that might sound totally, totally nonsensical to people in the West. But that's it. I mean, that's exactly, it makes perfect sense to anyone else listening to her story. Because by running away and joining this group of people, she's now the the sole person in charge of her destiny. She is now a fighter. You know, she is... And this young woman, by the way, I mean, she wasn't a fighter, actually, but she was a kind of propagandist. You know, she would engage in the online baiting and trolling and incitements. And um, she's now a she's now a powerful figure, you know, from a from a sort of captive teenager. She's a powerful woman that to miss that, I think, is to just miss the entire the heart of it altogether. When you were trying to picture how a young man could give up a life of comfort for armed struggle, was your father's move to armed struggle on on your mind? Obviously, the situations are very different in the the content of the politics. But did that family history inform your thinking? It didn't because I – my father was 25 years old when his his father was killed and he had spent – years uh, traveling all over the world, lobbying for, for his father's life. In the two years between your grandfather being overthrown and his execution. Yes, yes. And he, 
And it was to nothing. It was to nothing because um, the West was going to fight a war in Afghanistan. They were going to need Pakistan's military support. And um, that was that. Uh, my father was a young man of, of a certain generation. You know, he grew up on Che Guevara, on um, the great liberation leaders of, of Africa, of, of Vietnam, of Ho Chi Minh, you know, and, and I think he was led by by a certain romance. It, of course, was a romance that, you know, ultimately destroyed his, his life, him and his young brother's life. But I wasn't thinking of him because I don't see a romance in this movement, in the movement that I write about in, in The Runaways. Um, I don't think it's a movement about politics, um, you know, to be angry enough to go and leave, let's say, your home in Portsmouth or Bradford or Alabama and go join IS in Iraq or Syria. It's not about romance. I think that's about fury. It's not about politics because, again, I I don't see, you know, for me, politics is 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 about justice. You can't say that running away to IS is about justice. I think it's about power. I think it's about fury, rage. I think it's about massive, massive isolation and alienation. It's, you know, it's, it's a movement made up of people who have no vision for their future, who have no place in their countries um, to imagine not political futures, but but personal futures ahead of them. And and so I think it's led by very different instincts. But when I was trying to imagine those characters, it, it isn't such a stretch to imagine how one can feel alienated and humiliated because to be a Muslim in the world since 9-11 um, is to feel those things all the time. You know, whether you live in France or you live in... America or you live in Pakistan, it envelops you in a way. Which is one reason that Khan appealed to so many second generation and immigrant Pakistanis in the West, including one of your protagonists. Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, first of all, he's a dashing person, you know, Imran Khan was a cricket hero, was an athlete, you know, was known for his, uh, as you said, his his skill, his strength, his his charm. And so he's not what people imagine about a place like Pakistan. You know, he speaks English. He went to the right schools. He's of the world. You know, he's someone who people can look at and say, oh, well, he's from my country and not feel, not feel like they're going to be put down for it in their imagination, I think. And, you know, Imran Khan did speak against the drone wars. He does say these things. The question, of course, is <laughs> what does he do, which is a different story. But, you know, Imran Khan's anti-West thing, his whole West, to- West toxification thing, is massively appealing because it's a rejection of a world that rejects you already, that never wanted you in the first place. And I think that's, that is appealing for a young person who didn't grow up in the age of Muhammad Ali, let's say, who rejected that world but paid dearly for it. You know, Imran Khan is not paid dearly for his politics. So, yeah, we have lesser heroes today than and we might have in the past. Yeah, in terms of the the lesser heroes, it's it's interesting what you said in response to my my question about your father, this contrast between the left-wing political violence of that third-worldist moment in today's almost post-political or post-modern violence, a difference that seems to encapsulate a lot of other differences? Well, you know, at the, at the time, again, you know, my father was standing against a, a dictator, you know, backed again by, by, uh, by not just Ronald Reagan's White House and Margaret Thatcher's 10 Downing Street, but really the CIA. I mean, he was cultivated. You know, it was a, a channel through which drugs, Kalashnikovs were brought into Pakistan. He had brutalized the Pakistani population, the al Haq, not just by abrogating the constitution and returning Pakistan to martial law, but he, you know, put into place public floggings of journalists 
beating of of women activists, you know, women that would come out to protest, were lati charged, were were attacked. It was a movement that that attacked minorities. I mean, it was. It was, I remember my father used to say, I mean, obviously, you know, the conversation around Thomas Jefferson is different today than it was in that period. We know so much more about Thomas Jefferson now, or we're able to speak in different ways. But I remember Thomas Jefferson said, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. And that that is what that generation of my fathers felt. Um, and what is more tyrannical than a CIA-backed dictator brutalizing the free press, brutalizing minorities, jailing thousands of political activists. Of course, the people today uh, who conceptualize resistance are another bag altogether. You know, I I won't even say, I won't even call those young men uh, people interested in resistance. They're not. They're just interested in violence. But what does resistance mean today? It's It's a totally bloated word. It means nothing, you know. Fashion models, celebrities, um, people with an Instagram account are all part of the quote unquote resistance. It's wearing a t shirt is resistance now, you know. Well, just look what American um, liberal elites did to the term under Trump. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's just <laughs> shocking. I, it's it it just kind of means nothing, and it it used to be something. Um, I don't want to say misguided, but even when it was rash, you know. It meant something, you know. It 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 was a, a a peasant army rising up against their feudal lords. It didn't mean buying a hat on Etsy and wearing it on the same day everyone else wears a hat and calling that <laughs> women's resistance. You know, it's kind of has to be remade. That word it has to be reimagined and rethought. I appreciate the movement, you know, of people that stood against Trump, but. You know, it, it was all all too often guided by, um, I don't know, by symbols or by a presence. Like, yeah, I found it fascinating that the Democratic Party at their convention, um, which, of course, everyone in the world watched because we had nothing else to do thanks to the pandemic. I mean, they didn't have one of their Muslim congresswomen speak, you know, after you have a president that institutes a Muslim travel ban, you don't have... Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar at the convention? Okay, let's say let's say they're too progressive for you. You don't have any Muslims at your convention? I mean, even the Republicans had a Muslim by default when they did that oath swearing in thing. You know, so what do we talk about when we talk about resistance? If we're not talking about solidarity, if we're not talking about standing shoulder to people who are being attacked? I don't know. Well, the the attachment to symbolic resistance was paired with an emphasis on what was symbolically troubling about Trump his rhetoric his tweets the sense that the new the news got, the news got troubling for liberal elites rather than their realities getting troubling which actually of course Trump did make people's realities more troubling i i mean i found it really interesting that you know, for the rest of the world, Trump was something the rest of the world had always known about America. But Trump was something Americans found out about America. Does that make sense? Yeah. At least that's what it looks to us on the outside, that they found out about it in 2016. And that today, on the day that we're speaking, they think it's gone. And that's what's frightening, actually. One of your protagonists learns about the left from a neighbor who becomes a mentor, an old communist named Osama, who wants to keep the flame of the left lit. And he shares with her not only Marxism, but also poetry and also a form of relationship, pushing back when she describes herself, I believe, as his student, the relationship of comrade. What sort of loss are you meditating upon there when when you're thinking about the historic Pakistani left and what and what sort of hope if any does it carry for the future well i suppose it's just that it's lost that i was thinking about when i wrote that character because the character of osama is is a kind of character i i knew growing up in pakistan and i knew them both at a distance you would see people um and at proximity because some of them were comrades of my grandfathers or my fathers or 
even people who had disagreed with my grandfather and father or my family. But there was this, it's such a beautiful South Asian figure that when they're gone, we won't have them anymore because we'll just have these kind of technocrats and uh, IMF bankers, you know, who are, and businessmen who have become politicians. But this generation of really freedom fighters, you know, that, that, that fought during partition uh, for freedom against the British, that even though they are Pakistani, you know, w- did not take the ambivalent response of, of Jinnah's Muslim League, but really were freedom fighters in the truest sense of the word, fighting against the British, fighting against the British's occupation of your soil, you know, the the way they take over your tongue and your language. And, you know, I remember, um, I, and I suppose the, the loss of these men is not just that they, they die out, that they're going to be gone, but that if they stay in politics long enough, you know, they eventually become the thing they fought. I remember one one gentleman who was a student leader at my grandfather's time, and um, he remained in politics all his life. And and even when I knew him as a 70-year-old, 80-year-old man, refused to speak English because of the British. That that breed of person is is a dying breed in, in Pakistan, sadly. And I just wanted to memorialize them. I wanted to remember them before they're gone. Is there a sense in which communism offers that communist past offers some future hope for a politics that transcends today's sectarianism and spectacle that reveals a more true picture of class and social conflict and that could then reorient politics around it? I I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I worry that the left today in its youth, it's kind of like this, the snake that eats its own tail, you know? I, I worry about that because I think... I think we live in, it's not, this is not to say that this is the fault of young people. I think the age we live in is a 24 hour age. It's not an age that, that encourages or supports cultivation or time, you know, which all political thought needs to mature. It's no coincidence that you pair this dying communist tradition with a sort of book orientation towards books. Yeah. Yeah. You can't have it with Twitter, you know, because it requires thought. It requires study. It requires reflection. It requires isolation and loneliness, which the age we live in today abhors. And so on the one hand, I'm so impressed by young people today because their heart is in a sense open to everything. So they don't have the kind of binaries that that resulted in, you know, misogyny and homophobia and you know, they don't really have any time for that stuff. They're really open in terms of thinking of new ways to see people and accepting people's expanding universes. I think that's really quite remarkable. But at the same time, they are that snake that eats its tail because what do they include? You know, who is an enemy? What do they stand for? What do they stand against? They don't, you know, this is all being discovered by the moment, you know, in the heat of the of the fray, in the heat of the moment, it's not a study. And so in the heat of the moment, you will miss things, you will hurt things, you will damage things. You know, uh, it's also language, I think, because things like ally, I mean, ally is such a ick word right now, I feel it's in the same way as resistance, you know, because it's not a badge one gives oneself, you know, it's a struggle one joins. And so it's not about the self, but it's become this kind of con- self-congratulatory thing to add on. Something you perform by it's a, yes. by, by anti-posting on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's anti, anti-posting and, and, si- and uh, virtue signaling, you know. And really, if you're an ally of something, you listen. You listen and you stand at the barricade behind the person whose fight it is, but you stand with them, you know? It's not about you. And these things, I'm sure they will get smoothed out in time, but I but I do worry about I do worry about the way in which the internet forces us to act rather than to think. One of your characters, Suleiman Jamil, who migrates from India to England in I'm guessing the the 60s, maybe? 
Is that? I'm trying to remember my timeline. <laughs> like more or uh, less. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Well, you know, I think he goes actually later. He goes in the 80s because he goes in the 80s because he just misses India's neoliberal reforms. Okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, so he. You write that he quote wanted to love his wife flamboyantly with panache. The way he had seen James Bond court Miss Moneypenny and all those lithe gymnasts and glamorous villains. In England, quote, he had hoped that if roulette tables, tuxedos, Aston Martins, and stylish gadgets were not nearby, they would at least be in the vicinity of his new, neat, and clean existence. But his wife did not love him, and after she died, England did not love him either, and the country wasn't so clean and rich, but rather, at least where he lived, it was dirty and poor and deathly quiet. We've been discussing a lot, and a lot of your book is about the intermediation of social media, but Jamil's case demonstrates that older forms of media were powerful, too. What's the same today, and what's what's different? Well, the lie is the same. You know, the lie is the same because Suleiman Jamil in the 1980s was infected with this idea that the West was best, you know, that the West was a place of opportunity and riches and all you had to do was be daring enough to grab them. Obviously, when he gets to the West, he finds himself not welcomed as this daring uh, would-be entrepreneur or this daring would-be entrant to this society. He's looked down upon, he's ignored, he's cast aside, you know, he believed all the things that he heard about equality and, um, you know, once once you're here, uh, you become part of the fabric. You know, no, uh, it, 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 it doesn't work like that. You know, you get ghettoized and ghettoized and ghettoized. And not only that, but the, the lie, I mean, was something even I was struck by. You know, we believe the West to be a place of really of, of wealth, of, of, of richness. And it's kind of shocking the first time you find that not to be true when you see that the West has its, its discarded and its peripheral, you know, who are rendered invisible too. And that's a, that's a shock for Suleiman Jamil, um, who couldn't even imagine poverty in any form existed in the West. So the lie, I think, is the same. It's the same lie that's present in American exceptionalism, you know, in Western superiority, that today they tell us, you know, through a Netflix show or, you know, tweets by the president that, that they told us before through cinema and um, novels and and the, the people they sent out, you know, as, as sort of Im- ambassadors of the lie. By contrast, interestingly, your old communist character Osama learns about the U.S. or the West not through film and media spectacle, but through black culture. It's something that if you're you're looking today even is quite fascinating. You know, when the George Floyd protests uh, broke out in, in America, they were met with a lot of international solidarity. I don't know if Americans appreciate the fact that people from, you know, Barcelona to Nairobi to wherever, you know, uh, Bombay also stood on the roads stood in in mourning for George Floyd. And they they did that because the story of third world liberation is a story that's connected to African-American struggles for liberation. It's connected to figures like Malcolm X, like Muhammad Ali, like, gosh, so many people, um, Maya Angelou. Two figures who also make an appearance in (laughs) your book. Yes, that's right. That Martin Luther King, too you know, the great musicians to the great athletes to the great preachers. It is a story that's not, maybe not appreciated enough in America, but I think it is appreciated outside. You know, the fact that Egypt meant something to Maya Angelou, for example. You know, Nina Simone lived in, um, was it Sierra Leone? You know, these were people searching and fighting for freedom that, that found the promise of that same struggle in the third world and, and connected to it and traveled there and, and engaged in engaged in not just traveling, but in, in real roots in these places. And, and, and I think those roots exist, and that's why you had those protests all, uh, all over 
parts of the world that you might think, why would they be on the roads for something that happened in an American city? Tariq Ali has written, quote, it will take an uprising on the scale of 1969 to shake Pakistan free. And he's referring to the mass student and worker uprising in West and East Pakistan that overthrew the military dictator, Field Marshal Ayub Khan. There are various strands of progressive politics in, in, in Pakistan, from the, the Muslim and Christian tenants of the, the Punjab Tenant Associ- Tenants Association, who have refused sectarianism and built a powerful social movement to protect their rights on, on army-owned owned farmland. More recently, the, the Grand Health Alliance resisting privatization of the medical system that was part of an IMF deal amid the pandemic. Also, the, the Pashtun, Pashtun Protection Movement, or PTM, a secular Pashtun movement against the military's brutal campaign against Islamists, but that really against Pashtuns as a whole, in the heartland of what's in, in, a, in a region that's considered the heartland of religious conservatism in, in Pakistan. Ali writes, quote, Mullahs are most effectively marginalized when people see themselves as irrelevant to their real needs. Could these various forces at some point in the future together articulate a different form of politics? You know, Dan, I think the subcontinent is, you know, it's called the subcontinent for, for a reason, I think. It's, if you look at the makeup of Pakistan, Pakistan's, each province is linguistically unique, has has a unique culture, a unique language, and essentially is, in the way we think of, let's say, European nation states, its own little nation. Um, you know, India is the same. Uh, what connects Punjab to Sin? Uh, what connects Sin to the frontier? What connects North India to South India? You know, these are not states. These are countries within a country. And so I would agree with Tarek by saying that what one needs is a is a wide uprising. But in a country like Pakistan, you would need leadership that could bridge all the all the nations within a nation in order to take it forward. And we don't have that yet. You know, regional leaders or regional movements can't fight the power base of the country. Uh, they would have to cross provinces to do that. And they will find it difficult. You know, even Imran Khan's PTI movement, again, which is uh, a middle-class movement, found it very hard to cross provinces. You know, they, are, they, they still don't have a foothold uh, across every province, you know, and it's a t- whatever they whatever games they've made are pretty tenuous. They can they can be lost as easily as they made them. So I don't think it'll be existing movements that'll do it. I think, as always, what one is missing is leadership. And when there is a honest and dedicated and transparent and just leadership, then I think anything is possible. The, the way that class conflict could and can displace religious sectarianism reminds me of the current situation in India, where you have Sikh farmers, Sikh farmers from the Punjab and Haryana engaged in this long running mass protest encampment fighting Modi's neoliberal reforms that were, will undercut state support for for grain prices. And it's this class mobilization that reorients friend enemy distinctions away from the terms set by the BJP's Hindu nationalism, which portrays India's Hindu India's number one enemy as its large Muslim minority and Pakistan. Can the pathologies of either country's political systems and ruling classes, can they be confronted without dealing with the sort of mutual feedback loop of, of sectarian nationalism that empowers reactionaries in both? Well, I would make a very, very important distinction between India and Pakistan here, Dan. I would say that um, the BJP, you know, a right-wing neo-fascist, you know, majoritarian movement was popularly voted in by the people of India, not once but twice. 
the religious right in Pakistan, the religious parties have never, ever, ever, ever been voted in to lead the country in Pakistan's history. Uh, the most, the closest you can get to the BJP in Pakistan's history is General Ziaul Haq, and he was a dictator. The Pakistani people didn't choose him and they fought him. Um, the, the rise of the religious this, you know, uh, violent religious element in Pakistan, sectarian element, was birthed by Ziaul Haq with Saudi money, with American money. It's not organic to Pakistan. And even today, even with the billions upon billions upon billions of dollars that these religious movements have taken in Pakistan, how many seats do they have in parliament? Three? Four? Twelve? I mean, nothing. They are, they are non-entities. Uh, the only reason they have any power is because people like Imran Khan, people even, unfortunately, like my aunt, ally with them. Why? Uh, it's it's, pol it's political, politi politically useless to ally with them because they don't bring anything to the table. They're not vote grabbers. They don't have large constituents. But they will ally with them you know, in this politically expedient way, and then give them seats at tables, which actually they don't really have a place at. So I think that they have an artificial power in Pakistan. They have an artificial role in Pakistan. And uh, they, they, need not, they, they need not have one. India, unfortunately, is a very different story. Um, India's, India's turn is, is something that has been brought uh, to the center by, by democratic elections. Uh, the religious right in Pakistan in their wildest dreams couldn't win those kind of elections. And they never have. You know, that's the other thing. They, it's not like we've ever had a period where they were phenomenal at the polls. They just aren't. They have a kind of mob power now. They have a mob power now, you know, and part of that power, by the way, is the Internet as well. And they have a power of um, incendiary rhetoric, which they use to pull people out to the roads and, and things like that. But political power, I, you know, I still do. I didn't believe it 20 years ago. And I, I still don't believe that they have real political power today. Well, Fatima Bhutto, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Fatima Bhutto is the author of the novel The Runaways and also New Kings of the World. Dispatches from Bollywood to Zeh and K-pop. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that the profound hypocrisy and inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization lies unveiled before our eyes, moving from its home, where it assumes respectable form, to the colonies, where it goes naked. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Izzy Olive. Our senior advisor is Thea Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please do find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes, you can also leave us a glowing review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners. So does telling your friends about the show. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks a month is huge.